Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, and again, we're ready to get right back to where we left off in our last program, and that'll be back in Acts chapter 5. And uh, the last verse we were dealing with was in chap uh, verse 30, where we made comment that the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew, and hanged on a tree. And uh, I said I thought it's Deuteronomy chapter 5, but I had to look it up in our break time, and it's actually Deuteronomy chapter 31. But uh, nevertheless, when you have your own spare time, you look that up, and it's pretty self-evident that this is what Peter was comparing the whole situation to. All right, now we want to hurriedly move on. Again, we like to always explain to our television audience because we know that every week we're picking up new listeners. Uh, it's just unreal. Or someone say, I just caught your program for the first time. So we have to let you know that we're just an informal Bible study. We're not connected with any group. We have no organization. We are uh, a ministry only for the sake of our contributors so that they can get tax-free exemption on their gifts. But other than that, we have no organization. We have no staff. <laughs> it's just my wife and myself and our bookkeeper. She takes care of all the books and Iris takes care of all the mailings and uh, I teach. <laughs> and uh, that's about as far as we get with it. But anyway, we do appreciate hearing from you. My, our, your letters are what keep us going. Just to know that so many of you have written to say that for the first time in your life you're seeing the scriptures in a way that you can understand. And as break time, someone was just sharing just a couple programs ago where he saw the difference between Peter's preaching and Paul's. Now speaking of Paul, Jerry just reminded me, and bless his heart, Jerry Poole is the one who has done all the, the last transcribings. And of course, Jerry's been in my McAllister class since about 1981 or 82, I guess. And he said, now Les, he said, I've noticed in my transcribing, he said, it's been a while since you were in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Because he said, those are the verses that opened my eyes. So he said, maybe before the afternoon is over, you better go back there. Well, maybe this is a good time as any, because see, I don't go on a format. So let's just go back to 1 Corinthians 15. It'll make Jerry happy. And uh, it just may open the eyes of someone again that needs these verses. Because when I stress all the time that Peter did not preach Paul's gospel of grace. I'm sure there are some out there then. Well, what is the gospel that I have to believe? Well, here it is in plain language. I used to say plain English, and that, that probably isn't the way to put it. But in plain language, <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and again, I'm glad we're doing this because as we continue on these next few chapters back during Acts, chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, and so forth, be aware that you do not see this kind of language. This is unique to Paul, because Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles again. All right, verse 1 of chapter 15. In fact, we touched on this in our class last night. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Not a gospel, but the gospel. That means it's one and only which I preached unto you, and which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are, what? Saved. See, it's by the gospel that we're saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, in other words, you have to understand and know what you believe. Now here it comes, verse 3. For, Paul writes, to these Gentiles now, Corinth is a Gentile congregation, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Of course the Old Testament foretold it, but it was in such veiled language they couldn't understand. But it was there, how he died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now that, beloved, is the gospel. 
Now, just to see in print how Paul puts all his emphasis on that, turn back with me then to Romans chapter 1, <clears throat> because it has been quite a while since we have delineated the plan of salvation on our program, and after all, that's, that's what we're here for, is to help people to understand how do we get right with God. How do we have the assurance that if we die in the next hour, we're going to be in His presence and not the other way? All right, in Romans then, chapter 1, verse 16, a verse you all know, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation. See, that leaves our works out of it. There's nothing we can do we can't touch this. All we'll do is tarnish it. So, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that what? Believeth. You see what that puts aside? Do You see how much of what so many people are hanging on to just falls away? But it's to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Oh, my land. Where can I show you another one? Let's come over back again to 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, for the preaching of the cross, see, is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it is the what? Power of God. Now again, I always, whenever I talk salvation, I always have to take your mind back to Israel coming out of Egypt under Moses' leading. And here they were at the shore of the Red Sea with unpassable mountains, impassable mountains on the right and populated areas to the left, the Egyptian army behind them, the Red Sea in front. Where are they? Well, they're in a dilemma. Does God say, well, hurry up and do something? Does he tell Moses, get out the boats and, and transport them? No. Unbelievable what God says for them to do. And what was it? Stand still. Do nothing. Now that's contrary to human thought. That's contrary to most of Christendom tonight. But God tells us the same thing. When we realize that we're in a dilemma, there's no way out except what? Stand still and believe that the God of Scriptures can get us out of our dilemma. And how? By believing. Not by doing anything, but by believing. All right, 1 Corinthians then, uh, chapter 1 on down, just a few more verses. Verse 23, but Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. Now think back, what has Peter been saying? Oh, you killed him. But God is raised from the dead. He can still be your king. Peter isn't preaching crucifixion as a means of salvation. Peter is cru preaching crucifixion to prove that God had overcome what they had accomplished and that he could still fulfill his covenant promises. But now Paul, you see, comes back and looks at the whole scene from a different perspective, and that is he did it for us that we might have life eternal. All right, we preach Christ crucified <clears throat> unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them who are called, in other words, the elect again, the saved, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now again, go back to the Red Sea. What opened the Red Sea? Well, not Israel, not Moses, but God's power supernaturally. And you see, when we believe the gospel, again, God works supernaturally and gives us a whole new nature, a divine nature that we can't touch, we can't put it in there, but God does. And that's what makes all the difference, and that's where faith comes in. It's by faith, see? Not by doing anything, but it's by believing. Well, let's see, another one, Ephesians, still in Paul. Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 2, verses that you all know. I'm sure you do. Ephesians, chapter 2. <clears throat> Starting in 
Start verse 1. Now this is strictly off the cuff. I didn't intend to do this, and you know that. But maybe there was someone out there that needed this. Verse 1. And you, now remember, Paul always writes to believers, for the unbelievers' benefit, of course. But to these believers at Ephesus, he said, And you he hath quickened, or made alive, you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Remember the first law that God laid on Adam? The day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Ezekiel enlarges on it and says, The soul that sinneth shall surely die. See? Paul comes back and he says, you are dead in trespass and sins, but God makes you alive. All right, then come all the way down to verse 8 of this same chapter 2. For by grace are you saved. How? Through faith. And what's faith? Believing. Nothing else. Believing. And then, that not of yourselves. See, just like Israel couldn't do anything to get across the Red Sea, there's nothing we could do. We're hopeless. We're helpless. But we believe. And then God does everything that needs to be done. It is the gift of God. Now verse 9, not of works. See, not of works, lest any man should boast. But it doesn't stop there. We're not saved just to sit down and say, oh well, a sigh of relief, I'm not going to hell anymore. No, that's not it. And that's only a small part of it. What's the next verse? For we are his workmanship. Workmanship. Now what does that mean? Oh, God's divine fingers have now come into our life and he has put us together as a new creature and a new creation in Christ. For what purpose? To bring glory to him. We're not to live to self. We're to live to bring glory to his name. Now the world ridicules that. But you see, the world has only got, what, 70 years on average? That's their heaven. That's their heaven. But oh, listen, we've got ages upon ages upon ages ahead of us. And it's going to make this old world at its best. You show me the most beautiful estate on this planet. And you know what I'll call it compared to what's waiting for you and I? A smelly pig pen. That's the best way I can put it. The most beautiful thing you can find on this earth, by comparison, is just a smelly old pig pen. Because, oh, listen, the scripture says that things are awaiting us that we can't even imagine. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And so I don't really care if we do go through this life of 70 years without much. I don't need it. Because... Oh, the best is yet to come. And it's not just for me, it's for you and for everyone that believes. Oh, now then let's go on a little further in chapter 2, a verse we've looked at so often, but again, for the benefit of new listeners. Chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 11, 12, and 13. Now this falls right in with what I've been teaching in the book of Acts. That Peter is still on Jewish ground. He's still preaching to the nation of Israel. Everything is still on the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now look what Paul says to us Gentiles. Chapter 2, verse 11 of Ephesians. <clears throat> Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh. See how that plainly that comes out? He's talking to Gentiles who are called uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision in the flesh made by hand. In other words, that was the way a Jew would refer to a Gentile, was uncircumcised. Now look at verse 12. That at that time... Now here's where I become a stickler for language. What time? When the Jew was still uppermost in God's program and the Jew was looking down on the Gentile as the uncircumcised dogs of humanity and they were in the driver's seat. And they had been. I haven't got my line up there anymore, but if I had it up there, all the way from the call of Abraham until we get the Apostle Paul, who is uppermost in Scripture? The Jew, the nation of Israel. But now read on. That at that time you, Gentiles, were without Christ, or Messiah, being aliens, see, non-citizens, from the commonwealth of Israel, 
strangers from the what? The covenants of promise without hope and without God in this world. Now, do you think I was crazy when I put on the board it was Jew only? With exceptions? Not really. I think I got it pretty straight. Because here this verse confirms it. That while God was dealing with Israel, the Gentile was out there without hope, without God in this world, because he was not a part of the nation of Israel. But don't stop there. What does the next verse say? But now. See? From Paul's day. But now. In Christ Jesus. You who were at one time far off are made nigh, not by keeping the law, not by practicing temple worship, not by animal sacrifice, but by what? The blood of Jesus. You see that? That's what made the difference. And now it's, it's announced to us Gentiles that everything that has been done has been done for us. Now, since I've gotten this far, I might as well answer the question that has already been coming in over the phone, especially because in some of our stations, we're only about a week or two behind the taping. We're not as far behind as we are here in Tulsa. But turn on with me to Timothy. First Timothy. Didn't intend to do this, but we got on this, we might as well continue it. 1 Timothy chapter 1. The questions have been coming in. Well, now, Les, you're saying you don't believe the church began at Pentecost. No, well, I don't anymore. I used to teach it that way, but I'm not comfortable with it anymore, and I've been showing why the language throughout those chapters, and I know that 90% of preachers and theologians who may listen to me are disagreeing, and that's their privilege. I, I, I don't care. But here is the reason... I've had so many people over the years that I've been teaching, as I have been now, ask, well, if the church didn't begin at Pentecost, land sakes, when did it? Well, now you know there had to be a period of time I had to say, I don't know, but I'm looking. And then one night, I, I do most of my reading and study. You know, my little wife doesn't get home until midnight, and I usually get home between 10 and 11, so I use that time with peace and quiet, and I can study and read. Well, one night, quite a few years ago now, I ran across this, and it just blew my eyes wide open, and I've shared it with folk ever since. When they say, when do you think the church, the body of Christ, began? I say, I think it began at the conversion of Saul. That's where I think it began. Now, like I say, you don't have to agree with me, but here's my reasoning. 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, in other words, there's no room for argument, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Oh, now wait a minute. Hold everything. Way back when John the Baptist announced Christ, yes, he did say, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, but that was almost lost in the dust. But what did John the Baptist really proclaim Christ had come for? To become the, the king. The king, see? And this is what Peter and the eleven have been proclaiming, that he had come to be the king. But now Paul says what? He came to save sinners. But now here's the next part I want you to see, that like I said, every sermon I've ever heard preached on it, that he proclaimed himself as the worst of sinners by virtue of, of whom I am chief. But if you'll just go and get a Greek dictionary or a Strong's Concordance, and you look up every other place in the New Testament where this word chief is used, it comes from the same Greek word, and in every instance it's referred to as the chief man of the island, the governor, the chief priest, the high priest. Paul and Barnabas were in a pagan city, and they called Saul, or Paul, Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. In other words, he was the preeminent speaker. Now, does any of that indicate something bad? No. It denotes a place of leadership, the head of the line. 
You got that? So, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the head of the line. And now look at the next verse. How be it for this cause? Now always ask yourself questions as you read. What cause? That he came to save the chief of sinners. All right. For this cause, I, Paul says, obtained mercy that in me, what's the next word? First. Now what does first mean? It means first. There's no way you can foul that word up. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering or per mercy or grace for a pattern. Now, I usually have to stop here and ask any of the ladies, or maybe a male tailor, when you are sewing a dress, what do you use? Pattern. What's the pattern? Hey, it's the outline of the original. It's the first. Now, if you're going to make three dresses, you use the pattern to cut out the first piece of material. Now, I'm going to ask you seamstresses, now, what do you use for the next pattern? The piece of material or the original pattern? The original pattern. See, I can always remember when I was young and I was building a small building, just an outdoor building, and I was busy cutting rafters. That was before everything was as modern as now, and I was still cutting them with an old handsaw. And I had four or five of them already cut, and my dad came along, and he said, uh, which one of those are your pattern? And I said, whichever one I use last. <laughs> And he said, Les, you're going to have a roof that'll have all kinds of bows and sways in it. Why? Because he said, every time you make a little mistake, you're going to multiply it in the next one. He said, always use one for a pattern. Well, I, you know, I had to learn like all the rest of it. Now, it's the same way here. There could only be one original pattern of a sinner saved by grace. And who was it? Paul. Have you ever seen the likes of the grace of God as it was poured out on that rebel on the way to Damascus? Nothing like it in human history. And he was saved the least meritorious of any human being, I'd say, that was living at least at that time. He had caused people to be thrown into prison. He had caused people to be put to death. And then God saves him? Yeah, he did. Without a cause by grace. All right, so read on. That in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern, he's now the original, to them which should, what's the next word? Hereafter. And what does that mean? From this point on. Not retroactive like the government taxes us anymore. <laughs> this goes from Paul on. Nothing retroactive from hereafter. And now look what he says. And again, I say this only for comparison, not to put down any other group or anything, but only for sake of comparison, for a pattern to them which should hereafter repent and be baptized for life everlasting. Is that what it says? No. But that's what Peter said. But Paul doesn't say repent and be baptized. Paul says what? Believe the gospel. See? All right. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So what am I saying? I think, and like I say, I don't call somebody a heretic if they disagree and still adhere to the Jews at Pentecost as being Christians. And I've said over and over, the Bible doesn't call them Christians. The Bible doesn't call people Christians until they're Gentiles at Antioch. But here, I think the Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is laying out so clearly that at that salvation experience on the road to Damascus, God saved the chief of sinners. Not the worst, necessarily, although he was uh, apologetic for that all through his letters. But he saved the leader of sinners and that everyone that now comes into the body of Christ are going to come patterned after him, and they're going to follow him. Now, I made the comment in my McAllister class several years ago when we were getting ready to study Peter going up to the house of Cornelius. And those of you who know your Bible, 
you'll know that that's in Acts chapter 10. And we had just studied Saul's conversion in Acts chapter 9. And so the next week when I get into chapter 10 and I get ready to start teaching about Cornelius, you know, I said, praise the Lord that chapter 10 follows chapter 9. Well, everybody laughed and they thought I was trying to say something funny, but I wasn't. I wasn't talking about the numerical following of 10 after 9, but the content. Because, see, in chapter 9, the chief of sinners now is saved. He's the pattern. He's at the head of the line. What's in chapter 10? The salvation of a house full of Gentiles. See? Now, if Cornelius would have been saved in chapter 8, then all of this would fall apart. And I wouldn't stand here and teach it. But it doesn't come in chapter 8. It comes in chapter 10. And then as we'll go on through the book of Acts, we're going to find that now with the conversion of Saul, God's going to take him down into the desert for three years and reveal to him all of these doctrines of grace associated with the church, things that have been kept secret. Now, you know, I've been stressing on this program for a long time. Deuteronomy 29, 29. We got one minute left. Let's use it to go back to that one. Because this, again, is, is so fundamental to our understanding. Why did God hold some of these things from Peter and the eleven? Why couldn't they have heard it and comprehended it? Because God is sovereign. Now Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things, see that? The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed. Now what do you do with a secret when you reveal it? Hey, it's no more secret. Now everybody knows it. But until it's revealed, it is a secret. And you remember when we were way back in Genesis, I told you that one of the names of deity imply that God is not only sovereign, but he has the right and the ability to keep things secret? All right, that's what he's done. But the things that are revealed belong unto us and to our children. In other words, God keeps things secret until he reveals it. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported, and your gift is appreciated. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.